our Lord Jesus Christ was for profit, and he spoke so often about the importance of profit, especially in the context of the harvest of holiness for the kingdom of God, whereby there can be a multiplication of one's investment, a leveraged investment, a tremendous return on your investment, ROI, where it's he spoke of 30, 40, even 100-fold. And that's really what we should be doing in the church while implementing best business practices. Hello and welcome back to Prosper. We're thrilled to have you join us for our second season. Now this year, we're shifting our focus slightly while staying true to our core mission. I don't know about you, but I've always been fascinated about these origin stories of entrepreneurs, those remarkable journeys that showcase their beginnings, challenges they faced, and how everything came together for them. It's inspiring to hear how these People navigated obstacles and turned their dreams into reality. In this season, we're excited to invite some of our favorite guests to share their stories as principled entrepreneurs, offering insights into their journeys and the values that drive them. So settle in as we embark on a new chapter together and let's discover the powerful narratives that shape the world of entrepreneurship. I'm excited about today's show because we're going to talk about how the church is by nature entrepreneurial and, and needs apostles with an entrepreneurial mindset. And as a special treat today, we're going to be joined by Father Robert Gall, who's one of the most entrepreneurial people I know and runs a whole program in church management, showing clergy and lay people how to bring an entrepreneurial spirit to parishes and apostolates. It's actually our newest program hosted at the Sioka Center for, you know, I mean, he started this a while ago, but since earlier this year, he's a part of our team here at the Sioka Center. And as always, I have Rebecca Teddy with us as well. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. I can't wait for everyone to hear. Do you mind if we call you Father Bob? That's <laughs> fine. That's Father fine. Father Robert feels too, uh, too formal. Um, We're but I can't wait for everybody to hear what you're going to say to us a little bit later about how to channel our zeal for the church and how, to, how the church really is entrepreneurial, but you have a really interesting origin story. I think you studied chemical engineering and you had a career in Silicon Valley and various other places. And then you wound up ordained to the priesthood by Pope St. John Paul II. So I'd love for you to just tell us that story. Like how did that background lead you to the priesthood and what did you learn and how did these two fields mutually inform one another? Well, St. John Paul II was very much involved in my vocation, and he's still very much involved in my life. I can certainly consider myself a JP2 generation priest. Part of the involvement was I am really sure that he was praying for me uh, without knowing me. Way back in 1984, when I made a trip with some friends from the engineering school at Washington University in St. Louis, we made a trip to Toronto, Canada in order to see John Paul II. This was just a regular pastoral visit, but there were hundreds of thousands of people. And we slept on gym floors and rushed around to see how much we could participate with any activity with the Pope. And it was during that trip that the question of the Catholic priesthood really hit me inside my heart, such that every time I would pray in silence, I do mental prayer, contemplative prayer, uh, the question would arise as I felt that the Lord was asking something more from me. I'd already made a commitment in Opus Dei to, to serve the Lord, but I was thinking as a, in a professional life, I already made a commitment to, to renounce marriage for the sake of celibacy for the kingdom of, of heaven. But uh, this new issue of the priesthood suddenly arose. And uh, later reading biographies of John Paul II, I learned that during his pastoral trips, he would often pray explicitly for priestly vocations. And then I had the tremendous grace, the blessing of speaking with him a number of times in Rome where I was studying, and I started as a professor at the Pontifical University of Holy Cross, which was founded by John Paul II. So my whole my whole life, my whole itinerary is very much tied up with him, and I know also with Andrea. So it's a real pleasure to, to be with you in this call, this podcast. Definitely. So uh, yeah. then later, when, when he ordained me a priest, it was, you know, of course, ordination comes from Jesus, but it was through the hands of John Paul II. So like Andreas, we are relics, relics of the great saint. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you guys forget it. <laughs> I love that. 
Tell us a little bit about your early career, though, the, the Silicon Valley part and what you have brought from Silicon Valley into your priesthood. So even before I got to Silicon Valley, I had this really special involvement in business as uh, an engineering student. I, I was really blessed in so many ways. One of them is I had the opportunity to work as a summer intern for McDonnell Douglas Corporation, which was subsequently bought out by Boeing. And I know that Boeing has a lot of issues mm -hmm. today. And part of that is part of those issues to understand them. One can also really reflect about how McDonnell Douglas worked as a corporation because the engineers were very much in control of quality and quality was paramount at McDonnell Douglas. In fact, I worked in the quality sector in the manufacturing, especially of F-15s and F-18s. And as far as I know, they haven't had any door plugs blow out of them <laughs> or, or wheels <laughs> fall off of them recently. But I, I remember really, really keenly once um, my boss there, he's a very kind man, he asked me to do something very basic. He asked me if I would make some photocopies. And then he, he put on a serious face and he said, could you do it for the safety of our nation? Which uh, this was during the Cold War when we were uh, basically at odds with the Soviet Union with uh, nuclear missiles pointed at one another. And it was really a powerful lesson because it indicated anything that we did there, even the most menial task, was for a tremendous mission. It was to keep our whole country safe. And that really permeated everything that we did. And that was an early experience for me that then when I was in Silicon Valley, I was working with, again, in quality engineering for robotic software of a machine that's called an electron beam lithography system which is used to make the masks or really patterns, the molds that are then projected upon the silicon wafers through photographic lithography in order to, in the manufacturing of semiconductors. We, I was again working in, in an area that was uh, highly funded by the Defense Department for this program that was called back then VISIC, which is an acronym like they like in the military, V-H-S-I-C, VISIC, which stands for Very High Scale Integrated Circuits. And our um, mission there in that very small company as a startup in Silicon Valley was about being able to make more miniature, more powerful, and yet use less energy uh, chips so that they could be used in fighter airplanes. Well, in that context, there was a tremendous sense also of mission, certainly that we were defending the nation, but even more so that we were working on a very beautiful product that was very powerful. That risked the kind of idolatry of the product. And there were some people there whom their whole life revolved around the product. But uh, for others, it, it was it was a way of, there's a, a kind of an ideal because when you're working on something which you know that your customers are pleased with and that is a very high quality, it makes it easier to get up in the morning and to work with satisfaction. I could add there were some unusual things that happened in that uh, that plant, that fab, one of the unusual things that I experienced, I was already praying about the priesthood and praying about what I experienced from St. John Paul II. And a few of my friends there were, and colleagues were open to the faith. One of my friends was on a path to being baptized um, and he had a Buddhist background. But I also worked with people who have quite different opinion. In fact, one day, and this made the, the workplace particularly exciting, uh, one day, a third of the people on campus there we were close to 400 people and a third of them disappeared so over 100 people and when i started asking around it turned out they had all been arrested during a drug bust that was due to an inside <laughs> effort by the part of uh, police mm -hmm. uh, so this this also led to some curious and, and kind of um comic consequences that had had an impact on my job because some of those who were arrested went to work for our customers and, and then it actually kind of facilitated the relationship with those customers in order to do industrial style testing of the robotic software. But aside from these odd anomalies, the <laughs> workplace was one of real conviction. In fact, there's a, an article by Tom Wolf, the hyper-realistic fiction author, in which he compares the origin of Silicon Valley and its entrepreneurship to Christian churches. And in particular, to the preaching, especially of Baptist preachers and also Assembly of God. And in fact, we experienced that on our job site, that once a month, the chairman would come in and we would have a kind of sermon. 
And the sermon was sort of about this machine that we were making. It was somewhat idolatrous in that sense. But for those who were able to find balance in their life, and it, it was a way of having a mission and that we were all united around this mission. This, um, I, I, you know, subsequently after I was ordained, ordained by St. John Paul II, I taught philosophy, especially moral philosophy, ethics at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. And then I became more involved again in business after a few years when I was involved in a project of giving formation in the virtues to CEOs. And it was an international program. And it was amazing to see how managers, especially top managers, were really excited about how the implications of Aristotelian virtue could have an impact on their life and on their business enterprise. Mm -hmm. And then that grew quite a bit, tremendously, that sort of interest into a kind of management consulting. And then there's another step that brought me into church management. But perhaps, Andreas or Rebecca, Mm -hmm. you'd like to comment. Well, one of the things I find very interesting is that you know, you're talking about these meetings with it. So we have so much in common, Father. I mean, we both are JP2 fans or products in a sense of his new evangelization. And uh, and we're both high-tech uh, entrepreneurs. I mean, we were all both uh, roughly the same age and, and, and went through the same boom uh, in the early 90s and throughout the 90s in, in software. You were more in hardware. But it's it, it comes down to the same thing. And I remember that, you know, we were all trained on a book I remember early on in my career, we were trained on a book called Selling the Invisible, talking about the cultish environment, about selling the invisible to say we have to sell people the vision of what would happen in the future and believe in the future. And that's what we're really selling, even though the product isn't there today. And and I find that that is you're right. I see I see what you're saying. It can be idolatrous. Right. And there's a there's a fine line there. And, you know, I think, you know, Microsoft was famous uh, on the Steve Ballmer to have these huge events where 10,000 people were there and they were all dressed. They, they basically make them all dress the same and they had their glasses on. And Steve would be there on the stage and rah-rah everybody about how much they're going to sell and grow and so on. And, of course, there was this sense of a movement and any movement like that uh, that promises a better future and so on always has, in a sense, a religious aspect to it. It can be a connection and it can be become idolatrous, right? And so in a sense, the, this, the, the tech world and, and, and the vision always of progress and so has a lot in common with religion, you know, because it, it's saving in a sense. But, and, and so business can lead to that. Um, what about the, the inverse? Have you seen that? And then you spent 20 or 25 years in Rome, no? And yes, have you seen the other side where when you're in Rome, in the corporate headquarters, in a sense, I, I don't mean this in a negative <laughs> sense, but in the corporate headquarters, in a sense of the Catholic Church, that the other thing, the other way around can happen, that religion is that is supposed to focus on the future and uh, on the faith becomes a bit like a business. I, I'm really happy that you bring up this challenging topic, Andreas, and it makes me think of a philosopher from whom I've learned a lot, had the, the, the opportunity to study with him at the University of Notre Dame in the 1990s and then maintain contact with him uh, throughout the years. And right, right now, he's well into his 90s. Uh, Alistair McIntyre is his name. He's really one of the premier moral philosophers of the 20th century. And he's also a convert and a convert from Marxism and anarchism to Aristotelian Thomism into the Catholic Church and a real believer in the Holy Eucharist. And his... Um, perhaps because of his Marxist background, he's very suspicious of institutions. He's very suspicious of a corporate culture. And I, I agree in, with some features of what you could call a Marxist critique of authority of organizations. And it's when the organization, the corporation, the institution becomes an end in itself. And then it can end up squishing, we could say, the human beings of which it's really make, it, it is, uh, is composed by. So oftentimes organizations begin with a dream and it begins with a dream of service for men and women, but then it can become an end in itself. And oftentimes this happens also in the church and the organization could be, I don't know, the the Friday fish fry at the local parish, or it could be the bingo table. And that can become an end in itself when really the only, I mean, of course, our Lord is the end. So we could say the Holy Eucharist is uh, the tabernacle is definitely 
an end in himself, our Lord in himself. But everything else should be service of evangelization and sanctification. And we both saw this with John Paul II, also his entrepreneurial style, where he was ready to t run risks of innovation. And two things that really stand out that, that I remember clearly that occurred when I was in Rome. And one of them uh, had to do with, I mean, he'd had these experiences in Poland of a Eucharistic procession on Corpus Christi and of a mass prior to Christmas for university students, which was very much organized around the sacrament of confession. And he noticed in Rome, this isn't happening, neither of those things, they don't have. And so he was told about the Eucharistic procession. He proposed it to his aides. He said, no, we can't do that because the mayor of Rome is a Marxist and the Corpus Christi is on a Thursday. So no one will allow us to do a procession in the streets because it'll cause traffic. Well, John Paul II pushed forward and the this Marxist mayor actually ended up taking part in the Eucharistic procession. And it became a huge festival with, and really a tremendous opportunity for evangelization. And with respect to that mass for Eucharistic, uh, for, for that mass for uh, preparation for Christmas, there were close to a hundred priests who came in order to hear confessions with tens of thousands of students who had come towards the end of Advent to St. Peter's Basilica. And of course, Pope St. John Paul II is such a giant and he understood so well the youth and he understood so well university culture that it was there was a kind of suspense of listening to him at the homily and seeing him at the altar. So there were many students who came often brought by a friend and perhaps they hadn't been to church for since their first Holy Communion. And yet they came for this mass and then they were invited to go to confession. And it was a big conversion in their life. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I had priest friends who were among that group of hundred priests hearing confessions out in the streets. I very much remember that from my student days in Rome. Let me um, keep us on the same topic, but slightly diff slightly change the track because um, we've talked a little bit or we've talked around the possibility of making business into an idol. But what can we learn positively from business? We who are in the church kind of professionally, like Father Bob, I'll even ask you, I'll, tee up a softball for you because um because this is a question that you ask provocatively quite a bit just in our lunchtime conversations which is is the church a non-profit <laughs> so yes. that's your favorite question you can pay me later <laughs> yes it's, yes it's, thank you rebecca and it's very much tied into kind of a next step in my vocation which was an encounter with cardinal pell cardinal george pell who had been asked by pope francis to reform the finances in the vatican and he came to some of us at Santa Croce, the Pontilla University of the Holy Cross, and asked us to start a program of formation really for priests in best business practices. Cardinal Pell liked to say that this is this will this is very important because it will keep priests out of jail. Uh, I prefer I prefer I prefer to put it in a positive light. And I say that it will help the church to save money and to save souls. And this is very much related to your question, Rebecca, because it, many people consider the church to be a nonprofit and it has that kind of tax status, certainly in the United States. And so we, we enjoy that and we appreciate it because of the financial benefits of not being considered a for-profit organization. But it would be really, it would be to castrate, to sterilize the church, to think that the church isn't for-profit. Our Lord Jesus Christ was for-profit and he spoke so often about the importance of profit, especially in the context of the harvest of holiness for the kingdom of God, whereby there can be a multiplication of one's investment, a leveraged investment, a tremendous return on your investment, ROI, where it's, he spoke of 30, 40, even a hundredfold. And that's really what we should be doing in the church while implementing best business practices. So what can we learn from business? It's sort of odd because business has learned this from the church and from the faith. And then <laughs> now the church needs to go back and relearn it from so many people in business who are like Jesus spoke about accounting and how important it is. And he spoke about investment and how important it is. So if in a church, they don't, they're not able to even understand what it means to balance the budget or to, to be able to pay their employees just wage, then that church institution is in contradiction with the church's own social teaching principles. So we need to be able to pay those who work for the church a just wage, 
uh, a living wage for their family. And we also need to develop that teamwork and that sense of mission that's inspired that I experienced in Silicon Valley that was often shaped by idolatry of the machine that we were making. Instead, in a parish, it's so much easier to have mission because there's a such bigger purpose and meaning for which we're striving for, which we're striving to help others to enjoy the deepest possible happiness and peace. What better thing is there for us to be united around in order to promote with entrepreneurial style, which means using creativity and innovation to find new pathways to achieve that end. So some have spoken about how the church needs to move from maintenance to mission. Too often in the church, there's a sense of protecting the institution. Oh, we've always been doing it that way, which is the maintenance model. We need to be able to think creatively, just as our Lord did, as the apostles did. And we need to go out, as Pope Francis is encouraging us to do, so that we can run risks in order to make the church actually more and more a force of globalization, which she has been since the days of Pentecost. Well, this is great stuff, but let's take a quick break before we continue our conversation with Father Bob Gall. Hi, I'm Father Bob Gall, Director of the Church Management Program at the Catholic University of America. Are you a Catholic layman, woman, priest, or religious running a beautiful school? Parish or apostolate, wrestling with finance and administrative issues you never imagined when you first answered God's call? Are you striving to build something beautiful for God and his people, but need training in personnel management, fundraising, and managing assets in accord with canon law? Well, the Church Management Program at the Catholic University of America's Business School offers a flexible program for you. Our self-paced online programs will help you and your team get the tools you need to see your mission advance, even beyond your wildest dreams. The Catholic University of America is now accepting applications for the master's degree in church management for those aiming to begin their studies in early 2025. One can also enroll in individual courses or pursue one of our graduate certificates. For more details, find us in the show notes of this episode of Prosper or visit our website, meam.catholic.edu. That's meam.catholic.edu. Welcome back, everyone. At the break, we were talking about changing the mentality of those who run church programs from, quote, maintenance to mission. What we're talking about is to not let the way things have always been done obstruct finding fresh ways to meet souls where they're at. It's just what you're saying reminds me of the reading about Peter and his buddies going fishing again. It's like, ah, this is all, this is, Jesus died and we're, let's just go back to our old life. Let's go fishing, and they, and and Jesus interfered in this, no, and said, no, don't. Let's not just do things as usual. When something gets hard, you go back. But he changed, in a sense, what you're saying, leading up to Pentecost. He changed their trajectory or trajectory to say, no, stick with this, and and actually follow him. And that following was actually different after the resurrection than before. You see what I mean? Like Jesus had them develop that they had to change in their approach and change in what they were doing, not go back to saying, we've always done this before, let's go back to this, but actually move forward. I think in it, this theme of entrepreneurship in the church, that every generation in the church is supposed to follow Christ in the situation that they're in, to, uh, to witness to Christ in the situation that they're in. Therein lies this, this challenge. And this is sort of what, what I learned from John Paul, just from his behavior and from my interactions with him is actually two things. On the one hand, this entrepreneurial behavior that he does, like he likes a good challenge. Like if you tell him no, or that something is out of the question, Pope can't write a book, you can't do that. And then he starts to read the book during the Wednesday audiences, which <laughs> automatically gets it published. It's brilliant. Uh, on the other hand, if you tell him you can't have a procession here, or they said you can't have the circus in Moscow, you know, use artists as, as diplomats in a sense. What I, what impressed me most, and this is the, uh, this going, at, you know, going after something, that, you know, unseen in a sense, that, that you, it's, it's almost a spiritual quest sometimes that what, what software or technology does, but the church actually is a spiritual quest. And what this happens is that there is starting to be a pecking order and people who are more in the center and are in the room where it happens and not and so on. And so that's why the idolatry can happen in the church. 
where we say, actually, it's the fish fry that's the most important thing, or it's me because I'm doing this, or it's who's closest to the altar and things like that. And what struck me is because this is, of course, exactly when I found the faith, I found it through him. And my first reaction was actually to say, you're my idol, literally, like to say, I'm your biggest fan. You're, you're the cat's me. I like to meet John Paul II was the man. He would not for a second accept that, not for a second, literally just passing, like, it's almost like somebody moving back and say, and pointing at the cross and saying, no, 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 you're not looking for me. You're looking for him. Right. And that's, and that ultimately is uh, is the true behavior, and I think that's what you're saying about the idolatry within the church, that it, it can become structural in a sense, and then we actually enjoy the attention we're getting rather than making everything at the end about about Christ. Not that the structure isn't necessary, not that good accounting isn't necessary and all that, but ultimately, you know, the goal of all of this is, is God, is Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah, certainly, and I think uh, all of this can be you know, with respect to structure, institutions, and what's often called charism, which is related to Pentecost. Charism is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And each of us has, we receive charisms, especially if we're open to them. And we, we strive to do the will of God. It's very much related to what we mean when we say, it's a very basic consideration, what we mean when we say that we're Christian. And some people, when they say they're Christian, they think, well, that means I believe in this certain doctrine, or I'm kind of a fan of this man or who's God, whose name is Jesus. And that would be a sense in which you could say that you're a Christian. You could also say you're a Christian in a sense that you belong to a group, you belong to a community. But uh, fortunately, neither of those come anywhere close to expressing what it really means to be a Christian. And this is why John Paul II was so attractive as a man and as a spiritual father, is because he manifested how to be a Christian is to be united to Christ, to be pointing to Christ for the others. And united to Christ such that, and this is due to, to grace within us, that Christ acts in us and through us. And this really enlightens what we mean by the call, the vocation to business and to, to entrepreneurship. If there is this higher mission, this will allow us to overcome any sense of idolatry in our work. That we have this higher mission, if we allow ourselves to be identified with Christ, so it's not simply that I'm putting my feet in his footsteps, but that I'm allowing him to act in and through me. Of course, this requires prayer. It requires going to mass regularly. So that the Eucharist is at the center of our lives. Then it can really be Jesus in me, which is what we, we indicate at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, through him, with him, and in him, that we're giving glory to God, to God the Father through the Holy Spirit. That this, any, any noble enterprise, which is any licit business, is about serving and about whether it's making silicon chips or making i suppose weapons that aren't meant for aggression but for defense and it's if you're making iphones or software that will facilitate the life for others or if you're working in a kitchen that's serving people at a table it's always about serving because profit is always somehow shared and it's shared by the community it should be for the sake of the common good not to fill up my barn with a whole stack of excess stuff that I mean, there's no point of that. It's not going to be useful for anything. But if it is to be invested, that means it's to be shared. And that the most powerful sense of investing and sharing is when we are communicating an ideal that goes beyond this life and will last not just forever, but will it touch eternity? Yeah. You know, I literally um, just had a student in my office like two seconds before we you know, turned on the, the recording here who is about to graduate and double major one of our you know best students, but he has dropped everything to join the Air Force as a pilot. And I was asking him, so this is a radical change for you from everything that I've known about you. And I asked him about like, why? What's, you know, tell me the story of this change of, of heart or at least temporary change of heart. And he's had, he's a politics major and has had a number of really cool internships on Capitol Hill. And he said, I think people in my generation, myself included, he said, are hungry for mission. He said, I'm longing to do something that feels important and to serve something that is bigger than myself. And he says, I don't feel called to the priesthood. He said, I have deep respect for that. But he said, I don't, it doesn't feel like anything that I'm doing is serious enough. 
and he's just longing to give himself to something serious. So I was really touched right at the beginning when you were talking about this sense of mission of being super, super proud of making an elegant or, or beautiful product or, or service. And the, that need that the church has, even humanly speaking, to tap in to the, that desire for mission in each of us. We don't actually feel fulfilled until we're giving ourselves to something that's bigger than we are. Whenever we go to Mass, and this is, I, I really like to pray about this. I think this is really important and it's underappreciated. Just uh, ordinary daily Mass in an ordinary parish. You know, hopefully there are people who participate in that Mass who are, actually they are, who are doing all kinds of important work. And to consider that that is being, that it's Christ in them that is doing that work. And that they are being fortified by the Holy, Holy Eucharist. They're nourished by by the body and blood of Christ, so that he is being carried out to do those wonderful, those wonderful activities. When I say they're important things, it, and it might be things that seem simple in a hierarchy of, let's say, politics or, or social, social economic status. Maybe, I'm, I'm thinking especially of mothers who are raising and teaching their children. That is such an important work because uh, the future generation depends upon it. I'm also considering a priest who's a friend of mine, his name is Father Tim who was a pilot and a, mm -hmm. an instructor of pilots and fighter pilots. And he became a special forces pilot. And it was when he was on a special mission all alone in a tricked out special aircraft and a flight that was going to take him more than 16 hours, if I'm not mistaken. And he was leaving the area of Alaska and flying over the Pacific. He never revealed to me all the details, but he was going to pick up some operatives from some island that he was alone out there in the middle of the night and just seeing the beauty of it all and the silence. And he really enjoyed flying. Well, he's now a Catholic priest and he's working at a, in a university chaplaincy because he decided at that moment that God was asking him to be a priest. Very well, that's beautiful. Um, but we actually have a lot of listeners and students who are on fire for Christ, but face this, temptation that say if i am and, and i went through that myself after, during my kind of conversion that i i felt well if uh, if i have this uh, love for christ that means i need to move into ministry and so of course this person this uh, priest friend of yours did that but at the same time you just said before that you actually find it beautiful that we become the presence of christ at 11 no? in in society can you speak a bit about this that how you would advise Somebody, we have a lot of students who, some some of them go into fo become focus minister uh, uh, ministers uh, or missionaries, and then they sort of say, well, it's sort of a letdown afterwards to go into a corporate job. But is it? Well, this is this is a tremendous question, Andreas, and it's related to um, Jesus said in the Gospel of Saint John, chapter twelve, "When I'm lifted up above the earth, I will draw all things to myself." And one can, of course, it was prophetic and he was referring to the crucifixion. He was therefore also referring to the mass and to the Eucharist that draws all things up to himself. But draw all things up to himself. Well, who is going to draw the new product in Silicon Valley up to Christ? Isn't that, by, isn't that meant to be those who are working in those areas that are transforming and sanctifying all of these realities in the world? Whether it's on Wall Street or in um, in uh, Menlo Park, Palo Alto, San Jose, California, or in some new area of new technology, which could be in Lithuania or Estonia, where people are inventing new software that's going to change the lives of all of us. What a beautiful way that is to lift all things mm -hmm. up to Christ, to create something new that's going to serve the others and really change the world mm -hmm. for for the better. And to do so because we're in love with Christ. And that yeah. is to put, that is to recapitulate all things at the, at the feet of Christ and therefore be presented to God the Father. I have this kind of game that I play. It's not a game, of course, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a back and forth with, it's sort of a game I have with the Lord, uh, actually with Our Lady. I, I was a, a rosary convert. John Paul uh, taught me how to pray the rosary. He told me to pray the rosary anyway. <laughs> so I do this of saying, I will bring Our Lady into a room she hasn't been in yet. So I feel like with my presence of saying, 
how many people have in this room prayed the rosary or this situation and bring her, bring the Lord into a boardroom or bring the Lord into a, an area in a business where maybe unless I go there and pray there, it will not have happened before. And I sort of keep a score of saying, you know, how can I make a habit of this to bring the, the Lord through prayer into areas, into places where he hasn't been? It's a bit similar of you saying when he draws all things to himself, we can be a part of that. Absolutely, especially in insofar as you are another Christ, that if you're in that boardroom, um, you know, of course, you don't want to go to places where sin is being is is committed. I guess there's some places that are kind of at the at the borderline, like a casino or something like that. But we yeah, certainly no, want to bring. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that. But uh, Wall Street is not a casino; it's a place of marketplace and of investment. And if we're in a boardroom there, and we realize that most people here are motivated just by greed, by money, or by power, or ambition. Or perhaps they don't really know what they're doing and they're kind of depressed. Well, it's an opportunity also to communicate to them through our example uh, that we can give an example of. And they may see, oh, well, there's a kind of joy and a peace amidst the, the competitiveness that's proper to the business place that they may notice in us, hopefully, in the Christian. And then that, because of that, they'll, they may ask, well, what, what is it about you? There's something special about you. There's some kind of joy that you communicate. Where does that come from? And maybe they won't ask you directly, but maybe the third time that you have an interaction with them, something will come up. Come up, And then it's an opportunity to, to challenge them. So, And that's the, the aspect of witness. So you can bring Christ, you can bring Our Lady. That's beautiful consideration, bringing Our Lady, because so many places, they're lacking the maternal today because of certain versions of feminism that really aren't able to appreciate the true value of the feminine. And there are versions of feminism that are trying to get women to simply, this is what's called androgynous feminism, that they want to get women to just try to be like men, and then they can be advanced somehow. Where, of course, there have been problems of discrimination against women that need, need to be rectified. But women need to be women and need to be feminine and bring that maternal uh, flair to, to what they do. And certainly bringing in Our Lady into that context is also a way, a way perhaps, of contributing to bringing that maternal and that feminine flair. Father, I want to give you a chance um, as we're winding in our final segment for you to talk a little bit about your current project in, in church management and how you, uh, and not just church management, but really it's a, a, something that's all open to principles of schools, any kind of, in a way you might say apostolic project. I'll let you talk a little bit more about what that project is, but while you're answering it, I would love for you to address um, a particular situation I have in mind many parallel situations, but I'll just describe one. This happened to me like 20 years ago. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. I won't name her because she doesn't hasn't necessarily given me permission to, to, to publicize this conversation. But she's somebody who has been for decades now a really, really important defender of religious liberty around the world. And she, when she got more interested in her faith a um, number of decades ago, she went and talked to her pastor and his response was, you know, can you do some, she's a lawyer, can you do some pro bono work for the church? And she just talked to me about how let down she was by that, that she's certainly willing to help, you know, and of course, parish life and the day-to-day the, the -day life of the church is a, is a communal project. But she was so, that the, the the sense that her, she was very let down by a sense that the pastor didn't have any sense for her own gifts and her own mission and saw every single person of the parish as kind of um, tied together under his mission and what he needed to do. And, um, and I think many very talented lay people have that experience of all they're asked to do is to tithe. All they're asked to do is to serve on, a, on something in the parish. And there's nothing, I have nothing against the parish. I serve on my own RCIA, you know, and, and other activities in the parish. But it's obvious that every parishioner can't just be on a parish council, right? That the parish is meant to be a place where we receive Jesus, we receive the Eucharist, and then are sent out into the world in the way that you're describing. So that in us, Jesus rides the metro and changes the diapers and, you know, and you know, and serves on the PTA at the local public school, perhaps, not, you know, not only in our Catholic institutions. Well, one of our, um, our, our courses within our curriculum is 
uh, based on Catholic social teaching, it's really meant to to bring out that feature of what it means to be a Christian that you emphasize, Rebecca. And it's uh, part of part of the title of the course is The Heart of Work, and it's inspired by a course that Andreas was involved in developing with uh, Michael Fakalik, who's the, the main uh, faculty uh, professor for that course. And it's, uh, it's also very much related to St. John Paul II's uh, theology of the body and how it's, it's meant to help everyone who works in the church appreciate that the church is meant to be this engine of spiritual dynamism that goes out from the church institution. So it's not closed in on the church institution. So it's primarily meant to empower us to act in secular affairs in the workplace and in our homes, as you say, even in the public schools in such a way that is appropriate to our Christianity and even with leaven and informing, bringing salt and light to all of those activities. So I met, so we mentioned this this curriculum, this set of courses. And so we, we offer in the Bush School of Business here at Catholic University of America, a master's of science degree in ecclesial administration and management. And it's one of our church management tracks for our church management program. And this is all designed in order to help all church institutions to implement best business practices. And these entail exercising the virtues of leadership, including the priestly virtues of spiritual fatherhood. And it entails uh, a cohesion of developing a team that is united by a mission. Uh, so uh, one, one, of the, one of the really important issues, we have a course that's on personnel, pastoral personnel management, in which you select personnel and you form personnel you give per personnel, those who are working with and for the church, you, you have high expectations for them, you form them, you help them to excel as individuals and in a workplace in a church, and which also entails an off-ramp if certain, if certain individuals don't perform or in the, they're in the wrong place. And so it's about a kind of efficiency so that we can achieve more effectively our mission. Another feature is that we help our students to think in with entrepreneurial entrepreneurial fashion and innovative fashion about how the current resources are used by their church institution. There are many parishes in this country. There are also schools that have buildings and have land, property that that are fallow. They're not really taking advantage of. And we're generally opposed, as canon law is opposed to sale of selling those properties. But there's often a way through a lease, for instance, or some other mechanism that you can bring in revenue that is in accord with the mission of the institution. And then you can use that revenue and leverage it in order to achieve more and more of your mission. And we use case studies and we, we bring in examples that are really powerful to learn so that everyone can reflect in their own situation in a creative way about what they can do to more effectively achieve their mission. For instance, there are parishes that have put into a lease some property and then buildings have gone up on that property that have brought in demographic increase of members of the parish. And the funds that have come in from that, they're able to rebuild their school and relaunch their school that was at the brink of bankruptcy. There's so many beautiful experiences such that we, we spoke earlier about how the church is a for-profit organization. And through these church management solutions, the church will have more revenue, more funds for more evangelization, more apostolate, and to save more souls. Eventually, I hope there will be more not just priestly vocations, but more canonizations, more people in heaven on account of this. So it's a very worthwhile investment also to contribute to this learning and uh, to, uh, to help and to spread the word about the opportunity for this coursework. It's, um, it's, it's really beautiful. We go through um, courses of business, best business practices in accounting and in finance and in fundraising and in management and leadership and virtues. And it's all within a spiritual context that's very theological, rooted in Vatican II and in the Magisterium of St. John Paul II. Who can this apply? is so thrilling to hear you talk this way at a time when, you know, every institution, like not just the church, but every institution is talking about decline and almost kind of managing decline. And it's thrilling to hear you talk in this way of, no, we're going for uh, demographic increase and canonizations. <laughs> Who can apply for this, Father? Who can apply? So it's uh, it was originally designed exclusively for priests, but we now open it up to lay people, and we're encouraging very much uh, those who uh, have some task of or hope to have some task of management in a parish, 
more and more. And it's a beautiful thing. It's one of the principles of, of Vatican II, of co-responsibility between the clergy and the laity, that insofar as the pastor of the parish can rely upon a lay person who can be the manager of the parish. It's so important that that person have full identification with the mission of the church and have some theological formation. So, for instance, someone who has a, a degree in theology and religious studies, is committed to the church, like to serve the church, and also has a propensity for the business side of things, they can definitely apply. Someone who is aspiring to being an administrator, a principal in a Catholic school. And um, so often uh, principals of Catholic schools today have a tremendous amount of formation. But like priests, they have a lot of formation, but very little preparation for the business side. And uh, I, have a, I have a priest friend who's in the program who said, uh, I've had nine years of formation and one clock hour having to do with business. <laughs> and then that was it of all that other formation. So they really just soak it up. We have wonderful testimonials on our website, uh, endorsements of our current students. Who One of them says, I've made mistakes. Uh, this is the priest. He says, I've made mistakes. But I know that I could never even contemplate making some of those mistakes again because of all that I've learned. And another said, it has totally changed my mind. <laughs> he just sees things in a new way. These, these are beautiful experiences that show how powerful it is to be able to incorporate some of these tools that we're communicating in the Bush School of Business with this entrepreneurial spirit that is so present in the Sioka Center. And that's why we're all part of the same team. Well, there is so much more we could say on this topic, uh, but that is pretty much our time that we have for today. I want to thank Father Robert Gall for joining us and for the tremendous gift uh, he is giving all of us through his church management program here at Catholic University. We will put links to everything he does in our show notes. And as always, thank you, Rebecca. And friends, thank you for inviting us into your home or commute or workout. However you make us part of your busy day, we're grateful. And remember, please, to tell your friends about us, subscribe to the Prosper Podcast, on your app or give us a good review. These things really do help us promote. Till next time, take care and we hope you prosper. <laughs>